Ken James is a Jungian analyst in private practice in Chicago, Illinois. He received a PhD in communicative sciences and disorders from Northwestern University and a diploma in analytical psychology from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. In addition to analytical psychology, he has studied and practiced a modality of music therapy known as guided imagery and music, or GIM, hypnotherapy, EMDR, and has done postdoctoral study at Chicago's Catholic Theological Union. He's done workshops around the world on the relationship between divination and synchronicity and on the use of the tarot as a way to explore the unconscious. The relationship between Jungian thought, clinical practice, and esoterica has been a strong motif of his work throughout his career. Dr. James, are you there? I am. Hello. Hi. Welcome to The Other Side of Midnight. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. It's really good to have you here tonight. So, we have a lot to cover tonight, and I was wondering if maybe you wanted to say a few words to start? Well, sure. I, I might begin with that quote. I could see where it, it might seem dark, mm, but, mm-hmm. you know, the, you see also in it the expression of a call that from a Jungian perspective, we would say the ego receives from a much deeper part of our personality, much deeper part of our being called the self. And I don't know that Jung was familiar with that quote, but I think it would please him very much because it fits very nicely with the way he understands the structure and the dynamics of the mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we need to cover for those out there who are not familiar with Jung, I'd like to start with who Jung was very briefly, what Jungian psychology is about, and then specifically, what is a Jungian analyst? Because you are a Jungian analyst. You're not a psychologist who's read a bit of Jung. You are um, a very rare breed, I have to say. Um, And I would like to go into a little bit about why that is. So let's start off with who Jung was. So Jung was a Swiss psychiatrist um, who began his work as a psychiatrist with severely mentally ill people in a psychiatric hospital in Switzerland called the Berkhosley Clinic. And based on his work there, he began to reconceptualize the understanding of working with people with severe mental illness. And as he was working, he read a book by Sigmund Freud on the interpretation of dreams, and he realized that Freud had expressed something that Jung felt was very important in his own work, and that began a period of collaboration between him and Freud that went on for a decent amount of time until Jung published a book called The Psychology of the Unconscious, which appears in in his collected works, a book, um, a, a set of 20 volumes of Jung's collected works. And when he published that, he had the temerity to say that he differed with Freud in terms of the nature of the fundamental energy of the mind. For Freud, the fundamental energy of the psyche or the mind, we use that term interchangeably, uh, was sexual in nature. And that was sort of the connotative meaning of the word libido in Freud's psychology. Uh, Jung questioned the fundamental nature of libido is being sexual. And this was intolerable to Freud. And Freud asked that Jung retract it, that statement. Mm -hmm. And Jung refused to do that. And that led to a very, very difficult break between Jung and Freud. 
that sent Jung really in, into a downward spiral. Among Jungians, we call it the period of his creative illness, during which time he produced what has been published as a red book. Um, but other people consider it to be a period of significant psychotic activity for Jung. Yes, right. Either way, based on that work, Jung was able to not only reconceptualize his approach to psyche, but I really feel he changed uh, the face of psychology and certainly therapeutic intervention. Um, and you know what's interesting? Yeah. I'm just going to jump in here. Yeah, is that we're talking about what year here? The very early 1900s, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But and so here we are 100 years later and not that many people know about Jung, but just about everybody knows about Freud. And that you know, and I come across that because of what I do and that I interview Jungian analysts and when I tell people that they say what? You know, who? And w- could I, could I just ask you to briefly tell us why you think that is, that Jung is not a household name, yet Freud is? Well, yes, there's a, um, I think a lot of reasons. I think also I would, I would add that at least terms from Jungian psychology have become household words. Yeah. But it's kind of unfortunate because taken out of context, they seem sort of shallow and silly, which they aren't. Um, I think one of the reasons is that Jung cast a very wide net. Uh, just the fact that, you know, I'm an analyst and I'm on this program talking about UFOs right. is an indication uh, of just how wide ranging Jung's interests were. Mm-hmm. And the reason that they were so wide ranging is he felt everything expressed the truth about the psyche. And that it really was our job to study anything and everything as a means of coming to a deeper understanding of the way the levels of psyche sort of communicate with us. But Jung was also very clear that who I believe I am, who you believe you are as a person, really isn't... um, the whole story for us, that there is something deeper and more real than our personal identity. And the term Jung used for personal identity is ego. And he felt that the job of psychology would be for the ego to become relativized to the self, which is a much deeper part of Mm -hmm. the psyche. Um, So, yeah. So you, we talked a little bit about who Jung was, and I have to say, I believe Jung was ahead of his time and was an extraordinary man. His body of work spanned decades, right? From yes. around 1900 until his death in 1961. Yeah. Yeah. And he worked and he wrote the entire time. He did. So we've established a little bit about who he was. So would you, how would you explain what Jungian psychology is? And the technical name of Jung psychology is actually analytical psychology. So when I read your bio, I said that you have a diploma in analytical psychology, which is the degree of a Jungian analyst. And that's a postgraduate degree. Yes, it is. So right. we'll talk, I'm going to ask you, how would you define analytical psychology? And then we'll get into what is a Jungian analyst. And then we'll bring in all these other, all these other topics that this show likes to talk about. Okay. So analytical psychology, as you said, is the, the school of psychology that Jung pioneered. And it's a way of looking at the psyche that seeks to help an individual progress along the path of what Jung called individuation. Uh, Jung said that 
although we call ourselves individuals, we really aren't. We are divided. We are individuals. And that we have to work very hard to become individuals. And the way that that happens is also one of the reasons why I think Jungian psychology is unpopular or not as popular as Freud. And that is that the ego, who I am, has to learn how to be relativized to a much greater part of the psyche. And so analytical psychology seeks to develop ways that people can relativize their sense of personal power to something greater. The term that Jung used for this is the self. And if you read what he's written about the self, it could also um, point to characteristics of uh, what people might call God or the divine. <clears throat> Jung said that he spoke as a psychologist, therefore he used psychological terms. But I think that's another reason why people are uncomfortable with Jungian psychology. It doesn't, it doesn't play well within the confines of academic psychology or even the confines of what the majority of psychotherapists want to believe the psyche is. Mm -hmm. So we have only about four minutes until our first break. Um, I, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned that some of Jung's terms are household words. And I'd like to go over those when we come back. Some of them include introvert, extrovert, synchronicity, archetype, um, anima, animus, and this show doesn't really deal with all those things except probably for synchronicity, which we, we're going to talk about later when we talk about Jung's relationship with Wolfgang Pauli. But going back to what I had asked you earlier about being a Jungian analyst, we have about three minutes. So would you tell us briefly what it took and what it takes for someone to become a Jungian analyst? Sure. So as you said, it's a postgraduate um, sort of training program. Mm -hmm. And even before you apply, uh, you have to have pretty much completed a full analysis with a Jungian analyst. So the prerequisite for even applying for training is completing your own personal analysis. That would be for the first time because you go through a uh, second analysis and, and a few others during the training. Then the training consists of a minimum of four years of coursework, during which time you are still involved in your personal analysis and also involved in an analysis of your work with clients. The clients of analysts are called analysands, and that's called a control analysis. So at one time, I was in personal analysis and was working with two control analysts at the same time, along with taking courses. And there are exams and there's a thesis at the end and also case write-ups at the end. So all the way through, there's evaluations, mostly oral as well as written it was grueling. <laughs> mm -hmm. It sounds grueling, but I also wanted to point out what you said about it being postgraduate. So in order to even apply to a training program, you have to have a graduate degree, which would be either a master's degree, a PhD, an MD, even uh, a dental, a DDS, a doctor of dentistry, any kind of postgraduate degree. So you yeah. can't just have a four-year college degree and no. then apply to a training program. No, no. Um, Jung felt that becoming an analyst was really a task for what he called the second half of life. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, when I applied, I don't think we can do this anymore. Uh, we were told that we couldn't apply unless we were over 35. So there was a kind of an age restriction in that direction. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we're coming up on a break. Kinthea, are you still there? Maybe she stepped away. 
So you're on the other side of midnight. Our guest host tonight is Laura London, and our guest is Dr. Ken James, and we'll reach you on the other side. Welcome back to the other side of midnight. Our guest host tonight is Laura London. And our guest is Dr. Ken James. The show is Our Human Need for Myth. And we're discussing Carl Jung. So, Laura and Dr. James. Hi, thanks. Yeah, we were, where we left off, we were talking about what it takes to become a Jungian analyst and what is involved with the training program and how this differs, um, my next question for you, Dr. James, was going to be how this differs from a clinical psychologist and how Jung's psychology, this is a big thing for me, differs from pop psychology. And I just would like to, to remind the audience that we're still just kind of laying the foundation here to get to the main topic of tonight where we're going to talk about myth and UFOs and aliens and all of that. So Jung, Jungian psychology differs from clinical psychology. First of all, the training differs because although there is an academic component, the primary core of training is the personal analysis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I knew that that was part of it. That actually was why I wanted to train as an analyst because I felt that was the only way I could practice with integrity would, would be to go through my own analysis. And in fact, when I started my analysis, I had no um, goal in mind to become an analyst. It was actually the furthest thing from my mind. I was on an academic track uh, um, in teaching in the university. So um, I began my analysis and realized I didn't want to do anything else but that. Wait a minute. Uh, so let me just jump in here. You, you were a professor and right. you were going through your own personal analysis with an analyst for your own personal reasons. It, wasn't, right. it didn't have anything to do with your career. No. no I've heard so many people say that. And I just have to say for myself, I entered analysis at a very young age, which is a little unusual because as you had mentioned before, it's kind of a second half of life thing. But I've heard so many analysts say that they had no intentions of becoming an analyst. Not all, but most actually that I've spoken to. For me, I went through a very lengthy analysis and I never, I have never had the desire to become an analyst myself. I think that that is not my strong suit um, to work one-on-one -on -one with others like that. So you're mm -hmm. saying that while you were in analysis, you realized that you wanted to do that too. Yes, right. Right. There was a freedom that I felt in, in the way my analyst practiced that mm -hmm. I, was an, I, I, had, I was working in a clinic at the university, but it was very restrictive. The way I like to put it is uh, when you work clinically, you're trained to ignore data because you have a paradigm that tells you what should be happening. And anything that doesn't fit that paradigm, you just kind of push off to one side or you label as pathological. Okay. So what do you mean by when you're working clinically? Well, when you're working clinically in a non-Jungian uh, mm -hmm. way, you really are looking at the paradigm of normality or the paradigm of functionality of the individual in the world. And so everything is geared towards strengthening the ego, strengthening the person's ability to interact with the so-called outer world, strengthening the individual's uh, capacity to adapt to all of the vicissitudes of life, the things that just come to us because that's the way life is. 
And that's a focus. It's to get the person into a good enough frame of mind and behavior so that they could go and live their lives. And any behavior or thought or experience that seems a little bit marginal or irrelevant to that primary goal is basically discouraged or ignored. Mm -hmm. And of course, for Jung, that's where the gold was. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go back to where we were, where you were undergoing analysis. You realized you wanted to become an analyst yourself. um, Mm -hmm. And you said something about integrity. And what I want to ask you is, or what I'd like to to point out and, and hear your thoughts about is you were you said that you had to undergo your own personal analysis in order to become an analyst. Clinical psychologists don't have to do that. They don't have to. Right? Psychiatrists don't have to do that. Social workers don't have to do that. Jungian oriented therapists don't have to do that. Right. But Jungian analysts do. And I think Freudian analysts Freudian do analysts as well. Freudian analysts do as well. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, the, all of the other professions that you labeled, uh, generally, acad- they're all um, sort of training that is done by an academic institution. And academic institutions, for a variety of reasons, are reluctant to require something like that. It's considered too personal. It's considered... You know, often it's strongly encouraged. Um, I've worked with people who are in training as psychotherapists in various programs, and periodically their university would send a paper to me to initial, uh, verifying the number of hours, which I hated to do because I felt that it was (laughs) a violation of of the analytic vessel, but I would do it. But it isn't required. Um, and so, yeah, so we, I think we've established what it takes to become a Jungian analyst and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of years. So start to finish how many years on average does somebody go, go through? So if you talk about start to finish the four year degree, which is necessary in order to go to graduate school and right. then minimum for a master's two years, PhD four years, and then how many years after that to earn your diploma in analytical psychology? So if you're very focused and a little bit manic, you could mm-hmm. probably finish it in about four years. Well, no, that would be the minimum. Yeah. So let's say four to five years. Mm-hmm. Um, In my experience, there have only been two analysts out of our institute that did it in that amount of time. Uh, I took four and a half years, um, and that that was considered pretty. You took four and a half years in the training program. Right. Right. But that's more characteristic of my personality. I just, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's really what distinguishes it from anything else is that you have got to undergo your own personal analysis. And would you just talk a little bit about what that means? I mean, what goes on in analysis? Well, it's, it's very individual, of course, but it, what it entails is being able to go weekly, sometimes more than once a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and sit in a room with your analyst and simply talk about whatever is coming up for you. Primary material in Jungian analysis, of course, is the dream, but there could be a variety of other sources of material, relationships, day-to-day life, difficulties. But it's not, work. it's not just chit-chatting, right? Oh, no, no, no. So the analyst is working with the analysis unconscious. Right, right. And so where I want to go tonight with you is eventually talk about the difference between the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious, because that's what we're going to be focusing on later when we talk about 
all these things that we have planned to talk about. Yes. So that so, was yeah. Mm-hmm. That Please was one of Jung's great contributions is his understanding that the unconscious as conceptualized by Freud had two at least two layers to it. And Jung was brought to the understanding of that structure of the psyche, not through speculation, but actually through his work with psychiatric patients. Um, One difference in terms of the patient populations that Jung and Freud work with um, was that Jung worked with severely mentally ill psychotic patients and Freud worked primarily with mildly suffering people or what Mm -hmm. was called neurotic patients. Um, Because of Jung's work with psychotic patients, he was presented with material that went far beyond what we would consider an ordinary individual life could uh, contain. And he began to wonder about what the unconscious really was. And in working with the unconscious, one of the things that you watch for as an analyst are complexes, which are kind of feeling tone sets of ideas and images that take a person over. So for example, you might start talking about um, a person's early school experience and their personal experience may have been that they were shamed and made to feel inferior. So they will begin to almost be possessed by a feeling of shame and inferiority that will then guide their, their behavior in ways that obviously is not going to be showing their best face to the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are as many complexes as there are people. So you mentioned the word complex, and that reminds me of what we were talking about earlier about terms that Jung coined that are kind of household names, Mm -hmm. um, but people don't attribute them to him. And also some of these terms are kind of misunderstood. It took me a long time to understand what a complex was because Mm -hmm. I was used to the phrase, oh, he has an inferiority complex. Well, that's not the way Jung used that term. And I would say that understanding what a complex is, is one of the biggest things that has helped me in my life is, and, and another thing that we learn in analysis is, that it's all about us and not about the other person. So mm-hmm. I have to know my complexes. And that's, I think, one of the things we do in analysis is understand our own complexes, not put it outside of ourselves. So um, that's actually what Jungian psychology was originally called, wasn't it? It was complex psychology. It was. That's well. It's interesting that you... Um, You say that complex psychology, Jung did discover the complex. He discovered it through uh, painstaking experimental researches with what he called the word association experiment, uh, in which the the subject, the person being examined, is presented with a list of between 50 and 100 words. They're just plain words. um, And the person is told when you hear a word, say the first thing that comes into your mind and the analyst writes down the association. Um, Ordinarily, the associations come quickly, bird, fly, dog, bark, but then there'll be a word and it doesn't even have to be an objectively loaded word and the subject won't be able to come up with an association or the association will have a significant delay or latency. And so the analyst takes note of that and begins to construct a picture of the complexes that the individual uh, struggles with. That was Jung's initial research. Um, And Freud felt that the concept of the complex was so valuable 
that even after Jung uh, and Freud split, Freud continued to give Jung credit for that concept. And yes, Freud referred to uh, Jung's work as complex psychology. Mm-hmm. So, um, but Jung was kind of struck by the fact that if, if complexes arise from our personal experiences, in other words, the way complexes form is I go through my life and most of the time the, the experiences that come to me, I'm able to deal with, but once in a while, there'll be some leftover material. I didn't quite process. I didn't quite get, I didn't quite finish. And that would be stored in my unconscious for later processing. And Jung, Jung agreed with that as an understanding of the unconscious. But what puzzled him was if the, the personal unconscious would just be filled with material from my day-to-day life that I was sort of putting there for later processing, why does it exhibit such an incredibly intricate organization such as having all of these complexes? Because life comes at us randomly. So my unconscious ought to look like the trunk of my car was just full of stuff, but it actually is highly organized. And Jung began to wonder where did that organization come from? And little by little over the course of many, many years and many, many uh, experiences with patients, Jung came to hypothesize that perhaps there was a substrate of the unconscious, a layer of the unconscious that was already structured so that when I experience my life, those experiences are actually being sort of given form by a layer of my unconscious that simply is present because I'm here as a human being. And Jung began to distinguish between that part of the unconscious that's filled with material from my personal life, and he called that the personal unconscious, and then this other layer of the unconscious that is really more about structure, and he called that the collective unconscious. And the structures in the collective unconscious, he called the archetypes. He eventually called the archetype. Mm-hmm. And they are structural elements of the psyche that are given. They are not acquired through experience. And so the, is this where myth comes in? Religion? Where, yes. All of those things, myth, religion, um, kinship, you know, cultural uh, rituals, all of these are manifestations or outpicturings or expressions of aspects of this collective unconscious, aspects of the archetypes. So I have a friend who actually he just finished a training program um, in another country. I don't want to give away who it is. And he is very adamant. He said, you are not a Jungian unless or until you have experienced the collective unconscious. And I don't question him on that because I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder what he means by that. Do you, could you tell us what he means by that? Well, I can't tell you what he means by that, but I would right. tell you what oh, I would mean by that. <laughs> that's such a Jungian answer. <laughs> well, I would say he's absolutely right, but I'm kind of a radical Jungian, so I would say you can't not experience a collective unconscious. Okay. The important thing is that you begin to notice that that's what you're experiencing. So would you give us an example of experiencing the collective unconscious? Any ritual that you go through, simple or complex, we, the behaviors, the, the expectations, the patterns that people go through in any ritual, are dictated by and supported by the collective unconscious. 
So just think of any ritual that you go through, a ritual of baptism or marriage or even family rituals. We, this is Father's Day. So the rituals that people might have gone through today to honor their parent would be both personal effort and personal activity right now in space and time in 2019 in June and the the structuring energy or forces behind those rituals are ageless and they come from the collective unconscious so it really is being able to look at our day-to-day life and recognize there's much more here than meets the eye much more and, here than we're given to uh, expect and there is a difference between a ritual and a routine right yes so what yeah, makes something yeah mm-hmm. well unfortunately a lot of of what ought to be rituals have become routine Um, And this is actually related to another concept, which is the concept of synchronicity. For an act, for something to be a ritual, by definition, there has to be some sort of action in the so-called outer world. But it has to be performed with congruent thoughts, feelings, ideas within the mind of the people performing it. And that unification of the outer and the inner is behind the notion of synchronicity. It's behind much of Jung's most profound teachings. It's what led Jung to study all of the things he studied. What do you mean? I think his interests, alchemy, Mm -hmm. um, divination, UFOs, taking a look at world religions, taking a look at mythologies from all sorts of cultures, Jung was seeking constantly evidence, data, to help him express his understanding of what this collective part of the psyche really is. It was a working hypothesis, I think, probably for more of his life than it was sort of a, a stated part of his psychology. And, and I always point out to people that Jung was an MD. He was a psychiatrist. Yes. He was a scientist. And he was very adamant about that as well. And I was listening to a lecture that you gave uh, at the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago, and you said Jung came out of a university tradition that very much believed that science would completely save humanity. That yeah. was the belief that was prevalent during his time. Yes, yes. And that's why Jung, and Freud too, for that matter, constantly referred to their work as um, experimental as being scientific and he was very proud of this because he felt that the same dedication that physical scientists brought to their domain scientists of the mind could bring and ultimately there would be a a a deep scientific understanding of this thing that we call the psyche and would you say he did? He I would did say he did, but, you know, by the standards of Western psychology today, both he mm-hmm. and Freud failed miserably. And that's really kind of sad because their researches were, had wide ranging impact and the implications of their clinical work, which is where they did their research. Um, really form the basis for any kind of psychotherapeutic interaction today of any sort. But much of what they did wasn't replicable in the way that modern psychological studies are replicable. And I have a lot of of, uh, friends who do, you know, lab psychology, so I'm not um, being critical of any particular person's work. 
but you know you can get a lot of funding for a study that will help you reduce nail biting in people through the application of certain treatments mm -hmm. and that will be able to be replicated and it might be useful for a chronic nail biter mm -hmm. but it doesn't really get at what what the human being is suffering from right what's underneath it what's underneath it and what it means you know that's that's another thing you know we jung was adamant that the most important thing to bring to any kind of so-called symptom is the question, what does this mean? That includes what may have caused this symptom in the person's personal history, but it also includes what is this symptom pulling the person toward? And that's the part that's often either ignored or thought to be way too strange from a Jungian perspective. And I think there's a fear of going that deep. And Maybe. it's a lot of work. It's and, a lot of work, right. Yeah, and it takes a lot of time, and not a lot of people want to do it. But like my analysts used to always say, you got something better to do? <laughs> right? Then work on yourself or know right. yourself. right. So that kind of explains why Jung isn't as popular as the quick fix, um, you know, prescribe a pill because Jung didn't pathologize things. That's true. Right. And, and that when I entered into analysis, I wanted to know what's wrong with me. Yes. You know, let, let's fix this. And it wasn't about that. And so it took me down this whole other road and we're coming up at to the top of the hour where we're going to have to take another break. And when we come back, I'd like to start talking about Jung's relationship with Wolfgang Pauli because that's who he, Pauli is who encouraged Jung to publish his work on synchronicity, which Jung sat on for many, many years. And synchronicity is something that you know, people think they understand it. I thought I understood it. And I'm still finding the layers to it. And that it isn't what people think it is. Thank Trust you. Me. You're on the other side of midnight. Our guest host tonight is Laura. Doc and Dr. James is our guest. <laughs> Welcome back to The Other Side of Midnight. Our guest host tonight is Laura London, and our guest is Dr. Ken James. The show is Our Human Need for Myth. What does our continuing fascination with UFOs really say about us? So please continue. Thank you, Kinthea. Hi, Dr. James. Hello. Um, before we go into Jung's relationship with the physicist Wolfgang Pauli, which is such a fascinating, interesting <clears throat> history, um, there have been many books written about it. I just wanted to say a few words about the archive of this show. Uh, it's streaming right now live on TalkStream Live, Blog Talk Radio, also on the website, theothersideofmidnight.com. But if you're like me, um, I live in Chicago. It's two minutes after midnight. I usually don't stay up this late on the weekends. Sometimes I do. But what I love to do is download the show the next day. And I still have an iPod in my old Bose sound dock. And it's filled with shows. In fact, what I neglected to say at the beginning of the show, I wanted to mention Richard how long I've been a listener of Richard C. Hoagland's. Um, I've actually been listening to this show, The Other Side of Midnight, since the beginning when Art Bell, he had to ride out his uh, two-year non-compete when he ended his Sirius XM show, Dark Matter, when he was returning with 
wait a minute, was that? Yeah, that was Dark Matter. He was returning with Midnight in the Desert. And I was so happy that he convinced Richard to um, have his own show and come on After Art. And that was the beginning of this show, The Other Side of Midnight. So I've been listening to it since the beginning. I actually structured my podcast to launch right around the same time. That was back in 2015. And I was looking through my iPod and the first show that, or I should say the oldest show that I have of Richard and Art Bell is, was, is dated June 7th, 1994, Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Um, and Richard back then was in Weehawken, New Jersey. And I have, I counted them, I have 68 shows in my iTunes library of Art Bell and Richard C. Hoagland. And of course, I have all of the episodes of The Other Side of Midnight. And what I wanted to mention to the listeners is if you can't stay up, if you can't listen live, all of the back episodes are available to download as podcasts. So you can just, actually, you can just stream the show in your browser. You don't have to do it like I do. I'm kind of old fashioned where I save the MP3 file to my computer. I copy it into iTunes and then I um, connect my iPod. I know it sounds like a lot of work, but that's how I do it so that I can have it with me. I also put it on my iPhone and my iPad. It's 33 cents a day, $9.95 a month to be a subscriber to this show. It's called Club 19.5 and we're going to get into why. Um, And you can listen to all the back episodes going back all the way to 2015. There are a lot of classics. Um, Did you know that Richard C. Hoagland interviewed Andy Weir, the author of The Martian, which is, I, I read the book, I've seen the movie probably a dozen times. And Richard interviewed him about that. You can also listen to interviews with Bruce Lipton, Joseph Farrell, Dean Radin, the late, great Jim Mars, the late, great Stanton Friedman, Russell Targ. Kinthea just recently interviewed Russell Russell Targ. So all of those interviews, those shows are available. If you subscribe to Club 19.5, 33 cents a day, it's cheap, it's worth it. The shows are long. They're three hours. I put them on while I'm cooking, cleaning, showering, so I can listen to them. And it's a great deal. So I highly encourage everybody to do that. So next up is Jung's relationship with Wolfgang Pauli. And Dr. James, take it away. All right. So probably the best way to look at this is Um, to consider Jung's concept of synchronicity. And Jung had come upon the notion of synchronicity, which I'll explain in a moment. Again, like with all of his concepts and all of his ideas, through his clinical work. Synchronicity is defined as a way that events are connected. And in order to understand synchronicity, we have to take a look at the phenomenon of time, and the notion of causality or randomness. So we all understand causality, physical causality. If I kick uh, a wastebasket, it's going to go across the floor of the room. If I push a door with a certain amount of force, it will slam. Um, Certain events cause certain other events to happen. Physical causality is a very powerful way of understanding the way events are connected in time. But we're not born with physical causality in our mind. It's acquired, which means from a Jungian perspective, that it's an archetypal pattern that we impose on the so-called outer world in order to make it a safer place in which to live. If you sort of understand the notion of physical causality, if you understand events that are linked in time in that way, it can help you avoid certain negative consequences and uh, improve the chances of experiencing certain positive consequences. So Jung said that that, of course, is one way 
that events are connected. And that was an essential way of understanding the way things are connected if you're going to do an analysis from a Freudian perspective. Because if I'm suffering now from a particular set of symptoms, a reductive or Freudian approach to that would be to go back in time, historically, to find out what may have caused the maladaptive behaviors that are manifesting now as this particular pattern. Jung said that is one way that events are connected. Another way that events are connected is just kind of coincidentally. One thing happens, another thing happens, you know, I park my car and someone is walking down the street wearing a yellow blouse. Two things happening at the same time. I didn't cause the yellow blouse. The yellow blouse didn't cause me to park my car. It just Mm -hmm. happens at the same time. Right. The third kind of way that events are connected in time are not through cause and effect, but also not simply random. This is when events are connected in time through an underlying meaning that is awakened in the experiencer when those two events are experienced at the same time. And this is what Jung called synchronicity. And the most famous example he gave, he talked about a young woman that he was uh, working with in analysis, and they both were feeling the analysis was just stuck just stuck. And one day this woman came in and she said, I had a dream and she recounted the dream. And in the dream, she dreamed of a scarab beetle like they had in ancient Egypt. And just as she was coming to that part of her dream, Jung heard like a a tapping on the window outside his office. And he looked and there was a beetle trying to get into the window. So he said he opened the window, caught the beetle, put it in the woman's hand and said, there's your scarab. And he reported that that opened up the analysis because it was a meaningful event that wasn't connected causally. And Jung began to take a look at those kinds of things where mind and matter or my inner experience and the outer experience somehow come together and disclose meaning to the person experiencing it that isn't causally mediated, isn't causally linked. And so I, I, mm-hmm. go ahead. Well, what I was, what I was going to say is that I just wanted to stop you there so that this doesn't slip through when we realize a synchronicity has occurred, Mm -hmm. what do we, where do we go from there? I think that most of us just say, Oh my God, you know, that I I was talking about my dream about a beetle and then a beetle showed up at the window and everybody's like, Oh my God, but what can we do with that? Right. Right. So let's move it forward. Right. right? So uh, Synchronicity is one of the ways that the the unconscious discloses itself to the ego. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do with synchronicity, that you brought up a very important point because a lot of times people experience synchronicities and they think it makes them special. Yeah. I think when we start to experience synchronicities, if we really pay attention to what Jung says about them, we should start to feel scared because what that suggests is psyche is saying, okay, you're simply not getting it. So I'm going to have to do this. And I'm going to have to break through your conventional understanding of cause and effect, your conventional understanding that the world of the mind and the world of matter are separate. They're not really, of course, but we like to live that way. It makes life easier. Um, When synchronicities occur, The world of matter and the world of mind are revealed as having a common link. So they're revealed. They always have the common link. We're just walking around, not really paying attention to that. Right. And then it shows itself to us. Right. And most of the time, I mean, it wouldn't be efficient to 
pay attention to everything. You know, why did I drop my tooth? You know, why did my toothpaste fall off my toothbrush this mm-hmm. morning? I wonder what that means. I mean, that could move into the realm of um, making life very difficult. On the other hand, when synchronicities occur, some truth about the mind and the matter connection is revealed to us. And that understanding or that characterization of synchronicity, Jung was helped along to get that conceptualization through his work with Wolfgang Pauli. Okay, so let's talk about how they met, why they met, but first we need to talk about who Pauli was. Well, he was a, go ahead. No, I'm going to say so briefly, who was Wolfgang Pauli? He was probably one of the finest uh, physicists in the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Um, some people have speculated he may even have been uh, smarter than Einstein. His work was more um, specialized and very, very much in the realm of physics. So it's, it was much harder to become as popular or be popularized in the way that uh, Einstein's work was popularized. But the few things I've read about uh, Pauli suggest that he was very deeply troubled, um, had difficulty with relationships, and ultimately sought help from Jung. And, and they were they were not around the same age. No. Jung was about twenty five years older yeah. than Pauli. Yep. But Jung and Einstein lived at the same time. They, they did, right. They were, Jung was born in 1875. Einstein was born uh, 1869. Jung died in 61. Einstein died in 55. So, but Pauli and Einstein did work together, right? I believe so, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I actually have a photo of them together. I'm not sure That's if right. it's on radio with pictures or not. I think it is. I think it is because yeah, I yeah. so so Pauli was troubled. He found Jung. He Pauli, his mother committed suicide. I think his yes. um, his first wife. Uh, the marriage didn't last very long at all, um, and he had a very difficult time with relationship. Although later in his life, he did marry. Um, he actually predeceased Jung, so he died fairly young. I think he was about 58 when he died. Um, but when Jung began to understand, and there, there's a, a whole book devoted to their correspondence, um, and then other books that just study Pauli and Pauli's relationship to Jung. But I think for me, the most important sort of way I understand the the mutually beneficial connection between the two is the way that Pauli understood um, sort of the the underlying ground of everything. He believed had a dual nature. It's called dual aspect monism, but it is important to talk about that that mind and matter actually are two aspects of the same original source. And so when synchronicities occur, we're looking at special cases or special manifestations of a fundamental um, unity between mind and matter. And of course, this is what Jung was picking up with all of his synchronistic experiences and examples. But, but it wasn't Pauli who coined the term or kind of discovered it, was it? It was Jung. It was, was Jung, it, absolutely. It, was it because of the relationship between the two, the dialogue, the letters, that they kind of discovered this? Well, I think that this is an example of what Jung did his whole life. Jung had, I mean, I'm I'm making this up, but it felt like he had such a drive to understand the nature of the psyche. And he would get glimmering, you know, glimmerings of it, and he would write about them. Then he would 
reads because he was widely read. He was a member of a variety of, of organizations. Um, he would read a contribution done by a, a researcher in a completely different field. And he would realize, ah, this is, this, I can use this to help me express more clearly this fact about the psyche that I've been searching to express all these years. A really great example is his idea of the self, which he had had for quite some time, called it different things. But it really wasn't until he was asked to write a foreword to, uh, to a work of Chinese alchemy called The Secret of the Golden Flower, that in reading that work, he realized, oh, wait, this is helping me understand the concept of what I call the self, help me express it in a particular way. And Jung did this with virtually everything that he encountered in his wide ranging experience with other scholars. And so his work with Pauli led him to have a, a more clear way of articulating this awareness he had that we now understand through the term synchronicity. Well, what else can we say about how this came to be as far as Pauli's work as a theoretical physicist? So was Pauli making the connection and then told Jung, you know, psyche and matter, they operate very similarly because there were parallel discoveries in physics and mm -hmm. in psychology at the same time. They both occurred in the early 1900s. So right. the parallel is that the subatomic level was kind of being discovered. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, in physics and then in psychology, the collective unconscious was kind of being discovered. And right. then those two people came together because Pauli came to Jung as a patient, right? right. And then right. Jung realized he needed a female analyst, I think, and yeah. sent him to somebody else. But then they developed a correspondence where they kept in touch and they stayed right. in touch for a very long time. And, and the letters are all published in a wonderful book. I have it. It's very difficult reading. It's called Adam and Archetype, the Pauli Jung Letters, 1932 to 1958. It was edited by a very good friend of Jung's, C.A. Meyer. Meyer. Yeah. So did you have anything else you wanted to say about Pauli no, before we moved on? That, yeah. that I think that they helped each other because mm -hmm. I think, and this was Jung's great gift, he would borrow and others would borrow from him because there's another I think it's a biography of, uh, here it is, um, book by Suzanne Geezer, The Innermost Colonel. It's a study of Pauli's dialogue with Jung. And, you know, one of the reasons Pauli is often looked a little bit askance by physicists is because of his, connect, his ability to connect mind and matter. So I think there was a mutual sort of fertilization. And, and that want, a lot uh -huh. of people associated with Jung. A lot of people associated with Jung. So I wonder how this ties into Jung's, another one of those terms that he coined um, is projection. And I wanted to talk about that at length tonight because of the subject matter that we're going to be getting into, which is Jung's book on flying saucers and UFOs are in the news right now. Um, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Fox News, um, TV shows on the History Channel, the Science Channel. It's kind of all over right now. And what I hear from people is that what they, what, what they think of Jung, what they think Jung said is that, oh, that's just a projection. And that's not true. That's not no. fair. Right. And that's right. kind of why I wanted you on this show tonight is to address that. Well, what I'll say, I'm, we obviously are going to be spending more time with it, but to, to imagine that Jung would ever say something like, Oh, that's just a projection 
would be to completely misunderstand Jung's approach because that, that is a reductive statement. Mm -hmm. That's a statement that says, oh, this thing I'm going to label as a symptom right. and make it a problem. And I think Jung's great, one of Jung's great gifts is not doing that. Yeah. And that's why if you read his, it's a, a chapter in one of his volumes, but it's practically a book in itself, his book on um, UFOs. One of the reasons why it goes on for so long is you see him respecting and struggling and trying to find a context for all of the reports that were going on. I think that book was published in 50. 58. Yeah. Yeah. And just and, so everybody knows, it's part of volume 10 of Jung's collected works, but it's also a book and that's in radio with pictures. It's also a book called flying saucers, a modern myth of things seen in the skies. And this book actually contains excerpts from, um, well, no, it is just all volume 10. Wow. It is long. Yeah, it's a long one. Yeah. There's other things in volume 10, but all right. that's a significant, significant portion <laughs> for sure. So we have about five minutes until the bottom of the hour. And I think that since I brought up Jung's term projection, we need to define that for people that might not be familiar with it. So what is a projection? So projection is a fundamental way the mind works. What I, I, I can only be conscious of a very, very, very small part of everything that's in my psyche. And all of the other material is in the unconscious. And there are various ways that the unconscious tries to communicate or disclose information to us. One is dreams, another is daydreams. Um, synchronicity is one and another very powerful and valuable one is projection and projection is the phenomenon where unconscious material from my psyche gets experienced as though it actually were part of my outer experience generally being presented to me through another person. So, for example, suppose that I'm feeling very good and very positive about everything, and someone comes in, and I think to myself, oh, they are just so negative. I bet they are cynical. I bet they, they can't appreciate how wonderful the day is. I have no data, but I just know it about mm -hmm. that other person. That's projection. It's experiencing unconscious material from within my own mind as though it were presenting to me in the so-called outer world. But we're not doing something wrong. That is no. what we do. Well, none of us would be here if it weren't for projection. Mm -hmm. Because falling in love, assuming that we, <laughs> we were born as a result of two people who fell in love at some point, um, that's projection. Now, growing to love one another, that's the work. Yeah. But projection, no, by no means is it a problem. The only problem with projection is when you totally believe it. That it's not yours. Right. That, oh, I, that is what's going on out there. And that could be for good or ill as well. Because when somebody says, you're not the man I married, you're not the woman I married. You're right. <laughs> I'm not. You've been trying to make me that. And why don't you see who I actually am? One of the things that I heard you say in a lecture that I absolutely love, it's become one of my favorite quotes, is we develop consciousness by becoming aware of how unconscious we are. Yes. Yeah. So with projection, we, we all do it. We do it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, the task is to recognize when we're projecting um, and to take it back, right? So yeah. when I talked about Jung's book, Flying Saucers, and how some people say he brushed it off saying it, everything was just a projection, and that's not true, 
What is it then? Well, I think it's much, much greater than that. And in fact, the aspects of it that are projective, because any experience involves projection, that's how we move toward knowledge, is project, pull back the projection, project something else, pull back the projection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And ultimately, what's being projected, Jung believed, was a very profound and mysterious part of psyche that he called the self. Okay, and with that, we are going to have to start wrapping up for the bottom of the hour break. And you, we, you mentioned the self again. Um, yes. And so we will come back uh, with talk of the self and with getting into this book, Flying Saucers. Um, and Kinthea, are you around? Yes, we're on the other side of midnight, Richard C. Hoagland, and Laura London is our guest host, and our guest is Dr. James. Welcome back to The Other Side of Midnight. Our guest host tonight is Laura London, and our guest is Dr. Ken James, and we're speaking about Jung and his special type of psychotherapy. It's a clinical analysis. Nope. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. So before we broke, we were just getting into Jung's book, Flying Saucers, A Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Sky. Um, it was called a little book. It's not just an essay. Um, it was written by Jung in 1958. And like I said, it's included in volume 10 of the collected works, which is called Civilization in Transition. And one interesting note, is I noticed that the editorial section says that in Flying Saucers, Jung examines the birth of a myth, which he regards as compensating the scientific trends of our technological era. So, Dr. James, um, yes. you were talking about the self before we went to break, and that's a large part of what this book is about. And about it being compensating, I'd like to get into that too, because that is a term that is frequently used in Jungian psychology, um, that things compensate each other. Yes, it's a way of understanding how the unconscious relates to our conscious mind. The conscious mm -hmm. mind, as I said before, is very limited and it will only see a certain very small subset of what's actually going on. And the unconscious comes along in an attempt to supplement the conscious mind and bring the conscious mind into a greater sense of its true wholeness by bringing up compensatory material. Compensatory and, material, okay. Right, right material that balances out or challenges the way the yeah. ego believes the world is organized. Because the psyche is always seeking wholeness. The psyche is always seeking wholeness. And that is what the self may be considered the archetype of wholeness. It's the core of the personality. But before we talk about that, I wanted also... Mm -hmm to be sure that we clear up Jung's use of the word myth, because that's a word yeah. nowadays that people use as synonymous with lie. Yes, exactly. And okay. when Jungians use it, that is not the intention at mm -hmm. all. Myth is the expression of something that is unable to be expressed in any other way. And yet the trueness or the rightness of it is experienced by the ego, even though it's ineffable, even though it can't be expressed except through myth. So when anyone who would say that 
Jung is dismissing the UFO phenomenon by writing that book, I think isn't really understanding what Jung meant when he used the term uh, myth. This is a modern myth. And I think he was really excited to see that this was becoming a way of understanding something because regardless of what it is in the world of matter, the way it has gripped humanity, Jung was saying, is what makes it worthy of study because it's touching something that needs to be expressed and apparently isn't being expressed in other ways for wide um, swaths of, of the population. So now let's talk about what this book covers and the fact that it was written in 1958. And here we are in 2019 and so much more material has come out yeah. about UFOs, UFO sightings. And just this evening before the show, um, when I was eating dinner, I had recorded this new show that's on the History Channel called Unidentified. And, you know, I've, I've watched all the UFO shows in my life. I mean, even before Ancient Aliens, every time there was a UFO special on television, I watched it. I've been to the conferences. I've been to Contact in the Desert. I've been to Alien Con. I've been to the Conscious Life Expo. I have had a fascination with this, I, I would say, my whole life. Because the the TV shows when I was a kid... Um, had this theme of UFOs. And I just want to go back to what I was watching today and Jung's book. Jung's book called Flying Saucers. They're not called Flying Saucers anymore. In fact, mm -hmm. what they were calling what I call UFOs on this show on Identified was UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. I'm thinking, why? Why did the name change? And I'm not sure, Dr. James, if you had read any of the recent news stories about what the, some of the military has seen, um, that it's shaped and looked like a Tic Tac. So yeah. a, a, I hadn't a, heard that. Oh, yes. A completely smooth, windowless, um, wingless, motorless thing um, and not entity um, that would imply it was alive right so Present. something something flying around that looked like a giant tic tac basically so that's not round which Jung talks about the mandala symbol of the self right right it's now a tic tac um, and then there's also for a while it was the triangle art bell he saw flying triangle so what's going on here well, let's look at mandala, first of all, because we're used to it as being a circle. And of course, a circle is a particular, a particularly powerful image because it has an infinite number of axes of symmetry. But essentially, I think what we're looking at with these phenomena is some sort of symmetry, which is very difficult to come, you know, balance one side and the other. And I think if we look, if we think in those terms, then a tic-tac or a triangle, triangle has, depending on the nature of the triangle, it's going to have at least one axis of symmetry. Mm -hmm. um, a tic-tac would have many. I mean, as I recall, they're sort of elliptic, Oblong. solid ellip. Yeah, right. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of axes of symmetry. I think the the idea of the symmetrical nature mm -hmm. is what would allow us to see it as a phenomenon in the outer world that is capable of carrying unconscious material through projection of the self. So if yeah. you were to tell that to my neighbor who saw a UFO, they would say, what? <laughs> right? Okay. What yeah. does that mean? Well, I, I, know, I, they, they'd say, I know what I saw. I saw something it, in the sky. It doesn't have uh, anything to do with me. A lot of people saw it. Yeah, that's true. Um, 
I would probably simply say, tell me more about what you saw. Mm -hmm. And why did you think it was so special? And I might say something like, sounds like you're pretty excited about it. I wonder, you know, what do you think that's about? Why, why are you so excited about it? Well, I saw this. I know you saw this thing, but you saw a lot of things yesterday. Why is this? Well, because it's from out of this world. And you begin to, to see what's being projected onto this. And again, like, like the term myth, projection is not negative. Well, what is it from the unconscious that's being brought forth might be a better way to think about it by these phenomena that are being reported all over the world now. But does it matter that it's not just an individual sighting? A lot of people are, uh, yes. yes, there are, there are individual sightings, but a lot of times, a lot of people are seeing the same thing. Absolutely. So what did Jung say about that? Jung said about that, and that's why I think they included this book or this essay in uh, the volume called Civilization in Transition. Mm -hmm. Jung was very aware and was even more aware by the time he actually published his work on flying saucers that the world, that people were feeling uneasy, that the world was in a very, very precarious place. And I'm sure that we can all relate to that now. Um, there appears, things appear to be splitting apart. Things appear not to be able to be reconciled. There's an atomization of things. You know, people, there's, uh, instead of more and more unification, which I think was the dream um, of the latter part of the 20th century, we're starting to see more fractionation, more breaking apart. And Jung saw this too. And he felt that what humanity was needing and therefore experiencing through their interaction with the phenomena that we call flying saucers or UFOs, experiencing something greater than ourselves, something that perhaps could save us or perhaps could make us more aware of what, what we're being, what's facing us. Um, I'm just looking at my copy of UFOs. I'm not fine. I... Yeah. One of the other things that stuck out at me about watching this current show uh, that's, that, that's so popular right now is that, and, and, this is repeated. This is something I've heard before many times is that these objects that are flying are doing maneuvers that they kept saying that we can't do or is nothing like we have. And this was a military uh, fighter pilot who said this. So that seemed to be a great concern of his is here we are, the United States of America. We think we are the most powerful nation in the world. I don't know if that's true or not, that we have the most powerful military in the world. Again, I don't know if that's true or not. I would like to think so because I'm an American, but that might not be true. And he's absolutely I mean, he's kind of beside himself and I could see the fear in his eyes that he thinks he's flying the most powerful fighter jet ever devised by man that's ever existed. And here he was confronted with something that could move yeah. faster than he could, that could do maneuvers that he couldn't do. So now what? Now what do we do? And that seemed to be the concern um, I wasn't hearing any of the military uh, pilots saying that they were afraid that it was being piloted by aliens, but just that, what is this thing out there that's more powerful than me? So this, I think, is very much related to what Jung felt had to happen for an individual to move along the path of individuation and become whole. And the term he used is 
the relativization of the ego. What that means is, you know, the ego believes my, you know, Ken believes I'm, I'm working my life. I'm, I'm doing my life. Here I am doing my life. And in order for me to become conscious, I have to realize that I participate in this life called Ken, but I don't run it. And that's relativization of the ego. And what you were just describing with this pilot sounds like perhaps we need a collective relativization of our collective egoic understanding of ourselves. And if we can hold that and not move to a place of either anger or humiliation, we may have the possibility of breaking through to a new understanding of who we are and how we have to interact with all of this that we label as not us. But until that relativization, that reaching out is not going to happen. Well, hmm. What I kept wondering is where do we go from here? Because again, here we are, 2019. I'm watching yet another TV show about UFOs, and I, I feel like it's just the same thing. Yeah, the shape has changed, and yeah, now it's a military pilot that's talking about it. But basically, if you boil it down, it's another guy talking about a light he saw in the sky doing maneuvers that he couldn't explain. And we're, we're, we're just basically saying the same thing over and over and over again. And I just feel like we're not g- really getting anywhere with it. And if it really were aliens from another planet that were here flying around, w- why is this not progressing? They're not landing. They're not interacting. Yeah, we hear the the occasional story that somebody saw aliens at the foot of their bed and they had this interaction with them, but we have no proof. Mm-hmm. We don't know. We So we don't know if it was a dream, if it was made up, right, right. if it really happened or not. So I just feel like we're not, we're not getting anywhere with this. And, you know, when I lived in Cleveland um, back in the 1980s, once a month, I don't know if I ever talked about this publicly. Once a month, I would go to a meeting. I lived on the east side of Cleveland. We would go to the west side with a friend of mine from college. And there was a group there that was, they called themselves CUP, Cleveland Ufology Project. It was the oldest continually meeting UFO group in the United States. And we would talk, they, they, because I would just sit there and listen, they would talk about the same thing week after week, month after month, year after year. It never changed. It was basically the same story being rehashed. So it sounds like you're talking about a ritual. Oh, well, that's interesting. I, I, that would be a way that I, because just what you described. Okay. So They meet weekly or monthly or whatever, and they talk about the same thing. Yeah, it was monthly. I'm sorry. Right. And that, I mean, that is one of the functions of ritual is to keep alive a truth that we don't yet or can't yet understand, but which we sense has to be kept alive. So it's a myth that we don't really know. I believe so. And I once heard. Jung's protege, uh, one of his closest pupils, Marie-Louise von Franz, mm-hmm. say, we need a living myth. Yes. And is, could this be it? It could be. It, that would be certainly what Jung is implying in his work. And, you know, I think here, some 60 years, yeah, after he published his mm-hmm. work, the same sorts of things are occurring. The important thing, I think, and this, this would be, you know, when you read Jung's initial um, prefatory remarks in his book, because it still is so important to large groups of people around the world, 
for that reason, it deserves the dignity of our investigation. And everything about it is important. Just what you said, Laura, I think is beautiful. I would go every month and I would listen to the same thing Mm -hmm. again and again. And that may be the point. That the idea that why hasn't it moved, that that is to take this and place it on some sort of linear progression. Like, okay, boys, if this is if this is real, why aren't you getting off the dime and moving forward? And maybe the point is not moving forward. Maybe right now the point is let's retell the story. Really? Why? Well, you got me, but that does seem to be what the human community has done for as long as we have recorded history and probably for a long time before. So this is nothing new. I don't think so. I think it's the manifestation is new. It's particular, you know, it's in the particular that we find the universal. That's uh, from a Jungian perspective, you know, people come in. And they want to have big dreams. They want to, you know, I want to have a dream of Aphrodite making love to me. And I want to have blah, blah, blah. Let's just see what you're dreaming because Aphrodite's there. Aries is there. Zeus is there. And at this time, this seems to be the mythic expression of something. And that needs to be honored and held And I believe little by little, things will begin to emerge. And again, the important thing is keep making the circle bigger and bigger and bigger. Don't start saying, oh, that's too crazy. That theory or that theory is, you know, too primitive. We gave that one up a long time ago. Holding the tension, I think, is probably the most important thing we can do when all of these. Right. You bring that up, holding the tension. And that's another part of Jung's psychology is holding the tension of the opposites. And it is so important. And I'm very glad you brought it up. And would you say, would you tell us briefly what that means? Because that is a very difficult concept um, to explain and (laughs) to live. Holding the opposites. Right. (laughs) <laughs> yes, clo- holding them closer and closer together until the transcendent function emerges, which is the third. Third thing that, and I think a lot of the reports, a lot of the ways that these phenomena are narrated, you know, when they eventually get, you know, put in some sort of narrative form, verbal form, I think that could be an expression of the transcendent function. We neither, uh, holding the tension means I neither go, I can't be seeing that, or now I've seen the truth. Neither one of those is holding the tension. Mm -hmm. Holding the tension means I'm seeing something I don't fully understand. I had a way of understanding the world. This doesn't fit. That's what holding the tension means, holding those two things and seeing what might emerge. And are we doing that? I think some people probably are, but it's very difficult to do. It's always easier to split. It's always easier to say it's this and only this. Or my favorite as a Jungian, oh, that's just all in your mind. Everything is, <laughs> I always say everything is. Where what, else would it be? Right. Water is wet. What are you telling me? It's all in my mind. Um, but, you know, we don't like to hold it because, again, this, this goes back to that concept of the relativization of the ego. When I hold the tension among two apparent opposites, what are those things apparently opposite to? The ego sees them as opposite. It is the ego that can't somehow hold them together. So if the ego can just stand there and hold them in a place of not knowing and be patient, something may emerge. You know, what if it doesn't? We've lost 
some of the greats in this field. I'd mentioned earlier Stanton Friedman, who passed away uh, last month. He, what I think of is he died not knowing. Mm -hmm. He he investigated UFOs. He was. I remember him on Larry King Live and. Richard interviewed him and Art and Whitley and you know he's he's been through it all and mm-hmm. he's been in this field he he was a physicist i believe and he died not not ever finding out what this is mm-hmm. and i realized that i'm probably going to die not knowing what this is because mm-hmm. i don't feel that we're really any closer Yes. So that I, I'm trying to get okay with that. Well, it's the ultimate relativization of the ego, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Life, I, my second analyst was a really great woman. And she used to say, you know, the self doesn't really care how many times you have to run into a brick wall before you say, ouch. It's just going to keep building brick walls. And, you know, the, the goal of whatever this is that we call life, if it has a goal, and I think it does as a Jungian, the goal is to become as whole as possible. And generally, for most of us, that means the ego has to understand its place. And it is kind of, of uh, sad to hear about Stan, Stanton Freeman, but... Um, I don't know what his personal experience was mm-hmm. at the end. Mm-hmm. I, and I don't know. I'm just, I rem, for some reason, when you were talking about him, I remember a story of Thomas Aquinas on his deathbed. Perhaps mm-hmm. you've heard it. You know, Aquinas, who wrote the Summa Theologica, who brought to bear all of the, the power of Aristotelian logic to Christian theology at the time. And it's reported that in his on his deathbed, he turned to whoever was there with him and said, I'm seeing something that makes everything I've done in my whole life just seem like straw. Mm. So we don't know at that moment when the ego is faced with its ultimate end, what that even means. And, and Jung would say, we're not even sure if that's an end, but it certainly is the end of something. Yeah, you know, I heard you say that in the lecture, and I must have missed that. There's so much Jung that I still don't know, and I just want to make this note is that there's still a large majority of what Jung wrote that hasn't even been published yet. But I did hear you say that Jung wondered if this process stops with death and that it, it might not. Yes. Right. That's fascinating. There's an, a really beautiful, and it's still available. It's now on YouTube, actually, uh, called Face to Face. It's an interview. It's maybe about 30 minutes long. I just watched it again a few nights ago. Um, it was one of the last interviews of Jung when he was, uh, well, obviously, when he was still alive. <laughs> because right. They couldn't interview him after he died. But it was, you know, close to his death. And uh, in that, he, that's one of the, the things that he says in that image. So we'll pick up uh, there. I think we're about to break. Okay. Yes, we are. <laughs> so this is Richard C. Hoagland's The Other Side of Midnight. And our guest host tonight is Laura London. And our honored guest is Dr. Ken James. The show is Our Human Need for Myth, and we'll catch you on the other side of the break. Welcome back to The Other Side of Midnight. Our guest host tonight is Laura London. And our guest is Dr. Ken James, and we're in discussion. Welcome back. Thanks, Cynthia. Thank you. Dr. James, another thing that I wanted to ask you about uh, regarding this whole genre is the flat earth theory. 
Mm. And this idea that we never really went to the moon. And those are two things that are still very popular today. Those, that kind of thought, which just, I find astounding. And I would love to hear your thoughts on the psychology behind those two things. So let's start with the flat earth theory. There are people out there and it seems like this society is actually growing. They have their own website. It's tfes.org. And I was looking through their FAQ and I, 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 I thought it was a parody. Uh, it's not. Um, they talk about barrel distortion and that it's all one big conspiracy, that all the world's governments are in a conspiracy to keep from us the truth that the world is round. This isn't just a small little group. This is huge. So I was wondering what you had to say about that. So the first question, I kind of, as you were talking, I pretended that somebody came into my office mm -hmm. and said, you know, I believe in the flat earth theory. A question that I would ask in my mind is, what's the archetypal ground here? Because we can hold certain beliefs for a variety of reasons. And I'm using the term belief not to denigrate in any way, um, because uh, most of what we claim to know is basically based on belief. So um, anyway, so you mentioned two things, barrel distortion mm -hmm. and uh, conspiracy to hide the truth. I'm not sure what barrel distortion is. I saw it in your notes, but I didn't. Um, but that sounds like maybe a scientific yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a camera quirk that will cause a picture to distort in ways okay. that are, you know, not obvious. So an individual that says it's that the reason that it seems that the world is round is because of barrel distortion. That seems to come from a different archetypal root than the people who believe it's, it's a conspiracy. Yeah. And so I would say, okay, what gods are underlying this? Barrel distortion sounds like the trickster. Mm, right. right? Uh, this machine tricks us because mm -hmm. there's something with a lens, and I don't understand that. But so I would say tentative that they are holding this belief, and it is being supported by the archetypal ground that we might call the trickster. The conspiracy to hide the truth seems like it's coming from a different archetypal ground, maybe an us, them, or we're the ones down, someone in power is dominant over us. So I don't know what we would call that, a dominance sort of archetypal ground. That's the thing about the archetypes, you know, in popular uh, usage, people think I'm a Jungian analyst, I would be able to rattle off all of the archetypes, right? like they're it's something that could be countable mm -hmm. this is really how we try to ferret out the archetypal ground what does that feel like what does that seem like conspiracy to hide the truth do we know any myths where that was you know that something was being withheld or something wasn't being shared that should have been shared um as i say that i'm vaguely thinking that there must be some fairy tale that's like that. But you want to get why is the person holding this particular belief? What sets of data are they accepting? And what parts of the data are they denying? Now, I know that Jungian analysts and d deal with the individual and it is the work of the individual. And that's actually one of the criticisms that I've gotten for my podcast is that, um, you know, we don't speak to the masses. We speak one-on-one -on -one to the individual. And my attitude is we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. We need, we need this information. So I'd like to help get it out there whatever way I can. So yeah, if you're working one on one with somebody who says, you know, I believe the earth is flat and everybody's lying to us, 
I can see how you would work with somebody like that. But when it's a group, Mm -hmm. is it different when you're dealing with a group of people who are all in that group thought, that group mind, that hive mind? They're all thinking alike. Yeah, yeah. They're all feeding off each other. Well, I would, assuming that they'd even let me into the room, (laughs) I would probably want to say, could it be any, could we understand this any other way? Because the important thing, the meaning of the word analysis is to loosen. So we're not decoding anything. We're not, you know, getting at the real truth underlying everything, because I'm not so sure that we're capable of doing that. Um, But if we can begin to loosen up the, the fidelity with which a person holds a particular set of beliefs, we begin to let a little air in. That might be all we need to do. My concern is that so often with things like this, and there's other, other things, a question often engenders a certain level of defensiveness. Right. And once that is constellated, it's very, very difficult. Well, you can't break through it. That right. you, you have to, a fundamental lesson that I learned early on in my analytic training is respect the defense uh, because it's there for a reason. We don't know why. I'd like to mention to the audience, uh, if you have a question for Dr. James, please feel free to call in. The call-in number is 917-889-8802. That's 917-889-8802. The next, the other subject I wanted to bring up along with flat earth theory is this idea that we never went to the moon. We faked the moon landings. And that that one kind of gets to me um, because uh, the Apollo missions, kind of a hobby of mine. I've seen probably every single documentary ever made about it. And at the end of one, I think it's, in the shadow of the moon, Charlie Duke says, why would we have faked it nine times if we Mm -hmm. faked it? It's hilarious. He pauses and he's just, he's just the the look on his face. He just, he just can't believe it. And um, I, I find it offensive that people think we fake the moon landings and I'm bringing it up because there's yet another new show about it called the truth of the moon landings. And it's a, it's kind of a, there are three people and one of them is a NASA astronaut that flew on the space shuttle. And it's, it's pretty, well, I don't want to give my opinion. I'm I'm going to keep quiet and let you talk. What, What do you think? Well, you know, the question obviously is why do you believe that? What does that mean to you? But that, that we you know, faked it, you mean, or that you believe that we faked it? Yeah, right. But you know, if we look at it, if we so you see the moon landing. I remember, I can't even remember. I think I was in college when the first moon landing happened, and I I remember seeing it, and you look at it. And it was unbelievable, but I'm speaking metaphorically. Now, suppose somebody begins to think, I wonder if that really happened. It seems so unbelievable. Now, there's a number of things here also that could be going on. One direction would be that becomes reified. Well, it isn't believable. Something is going on, and, but it, it can't be what it seems. Okay, and there could be a whole lot of reasons why somebody would go in that direction. Um, another direction that that might might go is um, let me get more information to see if it's believable. But the the first reaction then gets crystallized in various different ways, and then it takes on a currency of its own. I don't think I'm following. Well, I'm wondering if I'm trying to hold 
I'm trying to respect the idea that we never went to the moon right. is a viable, honest way that somebody might think. Okay. And I'm struggling with that mm-hmm. for the same reasons that you are. But again, I, I think this way. So somebody's going, I don't really believe we went to the moon. Well, tell me what you do think. Well, mm-hmm. there it's, it's a, you know, somebody's made this up. Why would they do that? Well, it's part of what they always do. Now we're moving into something else. We could call it a paranoid fantasy, or we could, again, what's the archetypal ground? What God is distorting, I will use that word, distorting this person's understanding such that it moves in this direction? Because that's going way beyond even just a simple, I don't think we ever went to the moon. So it's a group of people, yeah, it's a group of people that have this belief and they have similar, it's a similar archetype at work yeah. in each of them. Yeah, yeah. And it, they're finding commonality at that level, which includes perhaps a weird sort of superiority that we will deny the documented data in favor of holding this, this attitude or this uh, belief or interpretation. Again, it could, is this the trickster at work? I wonder if it's the trickster. I wonder if it's something more, it's like a distorting. Um. So one of the arguments is that the United States was in competition with the Russians and wanted to beat the Russians to the moon, which we did. So mm-hmm. we realized that their, their thinking is we realized we couldn't pull it off, so we would fake it. And this was to achieve dominance because wow. if we, were, if we were to fail, because we did not beat the Russians into space, they sent Sputnik up and they sent the first man yeah. up, Yuri Gregarin, yeah. right? Beat Alan Shepard. So this would make us less than because we weren't first and we're huh. the United States of America. We're the superpower, right? We have to be first. So, what if we were second? Right. Just as you were talking, I thought, okay, um, as you were expressing that, I'm thinking, okay, I'm getting a little bit more about the personal material of, a, of that person who is saying that. In other words, well, we, we didn't want to be the loser, so we faked it. Mm-hmm. I... I don't know that I'd want to golf with that person if we were each taking our own score. (laughs) Um, Mm. That almost feels more like the person taking, maybe it's shadowy, I don't know, an attribute of their own psyche and blowing it up, projecting it onto the government and saying that's what they're doing. Interesting that you mentioned shadow that I haven't brought up. So we've been on the air for two hours and 15 minutes and I neglected to mention my number one, the, my favorite thing to talk about, which is the shadow. And oh. I guess I didn't realize that it would come into play here and how silly of me, because of course it would. Shadows so everywhere. shadows everywhere. Yeah. And so would you tell, would you first define for those who are not familiar with the term, the Jungian term, the way Jung used it, and he was the first to coin it in this way. So what is the shadow? So in order to understand the shadow, we have to understand another factor that Jung called the persona. So here's my ego. And as I'm going through my life, I sort of begin to construct an identity that sort of comes between me and the outer world. And it's filled with attributes that I want to have be true about me. So it might be someone who's honest or someone who's compassionate or someone who is attractive or someone who is um, generous or whatever. We more or less unconsciously, but there's some deliberation here, construct a persona and every one of the attributes in the persona, because everything exists 
psychically, at least in a polarity. Everything in our persona is going to have its opposite that will then be in my unconscious. Mm -hmm. So the shadow is actually made up of all of the material not included in the persona, sort of as a, um, a negative is to a photograph. And that's what the shadow is. Now, the shadow is a very uncomfortable thing to carry around because the shadow is actually comprised of qualities that, although I am not going to include them in my persona, they refer to actions or attitudes or beliefs or tendencies that I could engage in. And so and it, I'm going to defend against them. Yeah, go ahead. Is it the case that we all have it all? We all have the capacity or not, not capacity, but inherent within us. We mm-hmm. have all the qualities. Yes. Uh, the ego doesn't have the capacity to, to contain yeah. all of them because that would be very damaging to the ego. But the ego is connected to the archetype of the self. And the archetype of the self is transpersonal. At that level, each one of us is connected to everyone across all space and throughout all time. And so, so, yeah. mm -hmm, So the short answer to your question is yes. (laughs) But the ego wouldn't be able to hold everything. Mm -hmm. So with the shadow, those things that we disown, we project it. And so if we believe that the United States faked the moon landing. Mm-hmm. What does that say? D- doesn't that say something about us? So what I'm trying to get at during mm-hmm. this whole show is that this is ultimately about us. Yes. That we're always pushing it out and saying it's about them. It's the government. It's the aliens. It's the this group, that group. Really, it's about us. And mm-hmm. that's a difficult thing. It's so much easier to blame. Mm -hmm. So much easier to blame or to praise than to realize I'm making all of this up. I'm not making it up out of any kind of arch or negative motivation. I'm making it up simply because the, the ego rests on the energies of the self, which are so vast. And the ego is in touch with that, but can't contain it all. So all of the things we're talking about, projection, dreams, synchronicity, these are all ways that the energies of the self can be at least be held by the ego, if not held by the ego. So we're doing all of this belief in UFOs, belief in the flat earth, belief that we fake the moon landing for ourselves, really. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, this project called Laura or Ken or Kinthia or whoever, that project is the most important project for each of us. And part of that project is coming to terms with all that we are and all that we cannot yet be. And that gives rise to this whole buzzing, blooming thing. Yeah, so if we hmm if we are projecting and we defend ourselves, we defend our projection mm-hmm. and somebody comes along and says, "Well, that's about you, not about them." And of course, that person's going to get defensive. So sure. there's there's nowhere to go unless you want to really take a good hard look at yourself. Right. I would, I would agree. Uh, the problem is that has to be something that occurs to, to us. I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could find a formula that would make everybody want to do it. You know, you mentioned that you entered your analysis when you were fairly young. Yeah. Um, the, I've had the experience of people coming to me that were, were very young, and we were doing very much in-depth analysis. I think 
the idea that Jung talked about the second half of life and the first half of life, that was a paradigm that was perhaps useful to him at his time. Okay. But I feel that things may be speeding up and changing because I have, uh, I'm assuming when you say young, you're in your 20s. I have some people in their 20s in my practice and they are dealing with very, very profound energies from the unconscious, both personal and collective. Yes. And yes, I was in my 20s. Yeah. yeah. And that happens for some people. It, it happens that early. Mm. Okay. Wow. So another thing that I wanted to mention is a theme of this show is that we may have originated elsewhere on another planet, someplace else other than earth. And that there are remnants of ancient civilizations in our solar system. And there is proof of that, and it's being withheld from us. So, you know, I personally, I'm not sure. I don't know what I believe. I believe that that is indeed a very strong possibility. Mm -hmm. But I ask where's the proof and some people have proof and show the proof but then others say that's not proof so there's this back and forth and there's this kind of we don't know again just like with the ufos Mm -hmm. so i was wondering if it was the same type of mythology at work with with that issue, with that subject. And I was wondering what you yeah. thought of that. So I'm actually taking notes while you're, while you're talking. Okay. So the idea that we originated elsewhere and that there are remnants of ancient civilizations scattered throughout the universe and maybe on the earth, each of those, I think, are wonderful in themselves because they are for me mythic expressions Mm -hmm. of the truth about the relationship of the ego to the self. Oh, that whoever it is that, that calls itself you has an origin far, far older than your first, than the date of your birth. And Why do you say that? What do you mean? Why do you say that? Oh, because the self is actually what gave rise to you, and the self is ulterior to space and time. Ulterior to space and time. It's not prior. It's not, it's like in a whole other dimension Mm -hmm. from space and time. So this makes sense to you when you, when you heard it, I could tell that made sense to Mm -hmm. you. Makes sense. The problem is it takes a weird twist. And this is what I can't get a handle on. And maybe it's just my own ignorance of this. I originated elsewhere. I can work with that. Okay. There's remnants of ancient civilizations. I could work with that. Mm -hmm. There's proof and it's being withheld. Okay. Now we're moving into something that's going to be much more difficult for me to work with. Do you want to sit with you originated from elsewhere? And what does that mean? Do you want to sit with there's remnants of ancient civilizations and what the archaeologists have told us isn't the truth? We can work with that. But if you want to spend your life railing at what's being withheld from you, that's going to bring you to a whole other path. So what's more important, actualizing your true origin and coming to understand the artifacts that would support that, whatever that may mean to you, or do you want to spend your life being angry at some sort of entity or agency or whatever you want to call it that has a vested interest in withholding the truth from you? I see where you're coming from. What do we do then with that anger? that 
let's say there is some truth that's being withheld from us that mm-hmm. we feel we have a right to. And nothing we do, no amount of screaming or signing petitions, stomping our feet, tweeting is going to change that. What well, do I'm we do get, then? I'm going to get very Freudian and say we've got an angry child. Yeah. That, you know, was not honored in the way that he or she needed to be honored. And I, uh, unfortunately, there's quite a few uh, of us that maybe our experience have experienced that and that's a wound i think that perhaps needs to be addressed prior to accepting all of these other things because these other things are there's so much potential in them but if we're going to focus on they're withholding it and there's nothing i can do to get what i want that's, that's going to stop us. That's going to stop us completely. And and I would want to work with someone to help them set that aside. Just for now, just mm-hmm. as an operating principle. What would happen if you just put that over here? What you have is what you have. There may be definitive 100% proof, but you don't have it now. And apparently you're not going to have it for a while, but can we go with these other things and see where they lead us? Right. Not easy to do. No. Well, and, and I doubt that I would be very successful in getting somebody to leave that behind if they really are deeply Mm -hmm invested in that belief. Mm -hmm. But we can, we can move past it and yes, I think, and set that aside and move forward with our work, our personal Mm -hmm. work, right? What we have to do, what we have to accomplish, Mm -hmm. which I think is important. That's more important because the other may be, you may see that you don't need any more proof. You've got what you need. Yeah. Yeah. So we are on the other side of midnight and our guest host is Laura London and our guest, Dr. J- Ken James. Our show is Our Human Need for Myth and we shall return. Welcome back to Richard C. Oakland's the Other Side of Midnight. Our show tonight is Our Human Need for Myth. What does our continuing fascination with UFOs really say about us? Our guest is Dr. Ken James, and our guest host is Laura London. And I'd also like to give a shout out to all the fathers who just had Father's Day. Thank you for helping to bless this planet. <laughs> Back to you, Laura. Thank you, Kinthea. Yes, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. I hope that everybody had a good one. So we're back with our guest, Jungian analyst, Dr. Ken James, who is actually here in Chicago, like I am. And we've been talking about Jung and his book, Flying Saucers and Mythology. And One of the last points I wanted to mention, oh, and also if anybody would like to call in, there's still some time and the call in number is 917-889-8802. If you have a question for Dr. James, 917-889-8802. Another really important subject that I wanted to bring up with you, Dr. James, is the Brookings Report. What would happen, do you think, in your estimation, in your opinion, to society in general, if it were revealed that we are not alone in the universe, there is intelligent life out there, and that we are in touch with it, what would that do to us? Well, again, I think it would depend on how 
wide a person's understanding of who they are can be. Um, there, there are certain sort of kind of mythic attributions to humanity that we're at the top of some sort of hierarchy. Right. And the, the current climate situation may change that. We may actually begin to see that we're all equal participants, you know, with the trees and the non-human animals and the oceans and everything. And, and we may, that, that hierarchical paradigm that hierarchy, the, the archetypal hierarchical approach may be shifting. That ground may be shifting. And if that could happen, then finding that there is intelligent life uh, on places other than the earth might be able to be accepted um, as sort of widening that circle. So instead of the archetype of hierarchy, it becomes the archetype of um, interdependence, maybe we could call it. Um, so on this, yeah. yeah, on this show that I was referring to earlier that I was watching, they talked about the our government, the U.S. government, not wanting to reveal the existence of intelligent life elsewhere because of religion. And it was the fundamentalist Christians that were putting a stop to it. This is not my opinion. I'm just talking about what yeah. I heard yeah. on this show that, that it would disrupt it so much and that they couldn't you know, risk it. They couldn't risk the collapse of the Christian religion. So I, I don't know. I just, don't see why it would do that. And I don't know why that's the assumption that it, that it would cause that to collapse. Um, what do you, what do you have to say about what would happen well, to our religion? Here again, I think we have to look at what, what energy, what archetypal function does religion play in the psyche of an individual? If religion is something that defends you against a feeling of utter helplessness or um, vulnerability, and you feel that that's taken care of because you, you have this religious identity, then yes, I think that could be very devastating. But if religion is if the function of religion in an individual is to help them feel that they are in relationship to something greater than they are, whether it's a deity or an understanding of reality like Buddhism, um, then discovering that there's intelligent life may in fact just allow that to be even bigger and bigger and and more and more acceptable i think one of the difficulties too is there's religion as you know an energy system that helps me understand my place in the universe and there's religion as an organization that gives me a sense of identity um that one is going to be harder because if my identity is as a whatever then and and it may have certain specific criteria for understanding my relationship to the divine, namely that humanity is the most important and the most highly um, blessed subset right. of sentient beings. And then that's going to be really hard for a person to accept. Um, but I think what we're seeing here is not just a question of will this knowledge destroy religion? Because frankly, if someone's religious faith can be destroyed by knowledge, that doesn't say much for the faith. Mm -hmm. um, because it isn't big enough. It isn't organic enough. But a lot of things can be called religion, just like a lot of things can be called dinner. But there's a lot of things that I wouldn't eat, <laughs> even though they're called dinner. Right. And there's a lot of things that I won't assimilate, even though it's called religion. 
So do you, so are you familiar with the Brookings report? I, I think, didn't you send a link? I didn't. Um, And just in a nutshell, it's about kind of indoctrinating us, getting us used to the idea that this could be, and it would be uh, brought into our culture via the media through television, movies, radio, uh, and magazines. And it would, as Richard would say, drip, drip, drip the idea into our society. And over time, we would get used to it. And I believe that I am one of those people. As Andrew and I like to say, we are Brookings babies. So I... You know, I when I was born, I watched a lot of TV as a kid, and mm-hmm. I watched these shows, like I said before, that were about space and aliens. And even, I think we talked about this on the show a few years ago, even the Flintstones had a little green man character, the Great Gazoo, who was from another planet, and only Fred and Barney could hear and see it. And I'm a kid and I'm watching this, right? So I'm used to the idea and I'm still waiting. I'm waiting for them. I mean, any day now, Mm -hmm. come on Mm -hmm. down, join the party. Um, I have no problem with it if there are aliens, no problem. I'm just wondering what's taking them so long. So (laughs) I don't know if it's because of my personality, my makeup, or because I am a, I don't want to use the word victim, but am I a victim of this media campaign to drip it into the culture? Well, just hearing you describe that, um, I was thinking of something else. So I'm, I thank you for that summary. Uh, It, that, that basically is the way that any, any mythic system, I mean, the, the mythic systems, and this sounds like a particular um, sort of oper- operationalization of a mythic system, but a mythic system is designed to help individuals create a worldview that admits certain and certain elements as possible and excludes certain other elements as impossible. And so what you're describing with, you know, drip, 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 Mm -hmm. you are being introduced to the fact that there is intelligent life on other planets. I think there were other shows that did drip, drip, drip about the world is a battleground and you had better be ready to take your place in the battle. Um, And I think a lot of the mythos that we are struggling with today was delivered to most of us through media like television Mm -hmm. and what's happening, you know, and I don't know about when you were young, but when I was young, we had, I lived in Chicago and I think there were five channels. Right. And so there was a fair degree of homogeneity in what people in the mythos that was being fed to us. I think what's happening now with all of the various ways that we have of getting information about the world, I think we're seeing a multiplication of these mythic systems. And I think that's leading to collective unrest because I'm not sure anymore what the mythos, what the mythos is. It's not a very limited number. I don't know whether that's doing justice to the Brooking report, but it sounds like what you're describing is what a mythic system is supposed to do for a culture. Hmm. prepare it right right prepare it to so, understand yeah, this in particular uh, way. yeah go ahead right, well what i'm thinking though then whoever devised this knew the truth if you're trying to prepare us for something is it just in case well there they is knew an alien tr- like go ahead and they knew our truth right what they knew what our truth, truth. I don't know. I mean, maybe the truth that they knew was that there is intelligent life in the universe 
that will be making contact with with the earth. So, but yeah. I, anyone who who see the, the the thing about a true myth is we can't you know there weren't a bunch of Greeks who sat around and said let's call the head guy Zeus. Mm-hmm. You know, over time it emerged. This sounds more compressed in terms of its construction. So Com- compressed in time. In time, right? Does it? Right. It seems because I. Unless, you know, this has been happening for centuries. Well, so I think the Brookings report was commissioned in the 50s. Okay. And I, I, it's been a long time. And I just feel like there's, we, we don't have anything more. So what? Mm. Am I missing something? Am I just so in it that I can't see? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I'm probably I'm the one that's missing something. <laughs> no, I, I just I just wonder. Uh, I wonder what they why they're preparing our culture for this. Mm. Why is this everywhere? Or maybe it that's not the case. Maybe it is us. So we haven't talked about the word alien. Okay. And this kind of little green man seemed to evolve into the gray. And I don't know if that's because of Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, Mm -hmm. and the gray depicted on the cover. Um, But aliens seem to come in all different forms now. Mm -hmm. There are tall blondes and short cobalt blue forms is it us i mean it again with the word projection are we projecting parts of ourselves onto or out there right there are mm-hmm. different aspects of ourselves that we have not integrated is well, that I what would, this is i would say certainly and i would say that this may be a particular 21st century manifestation late 20th early 21st century but you know the idea that there has that there is another world or another dimension or another um, set of individuals that cohabit what we understand to be our domain um, is i mean that that's been throughout history mm-hmm. You know, belief in fairies, belief in spirits, and that phenomenon, that there always has been this theme that there is something more that we don't know, and there are other beings that are not like us. Um, That, I think, is where we begin to see the archetypal pattern. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're not there. No, not no, at all. No. So I guess the I argument that I more evidence that there is something there. We just same, keep change, well we just keep changing the the metaphors. We keep, you know, changing the ritual clo- the uh, mythic clothing. Okay, so use. let's just break this one example down for everybody that they can we can leave them with this. If we say, if somebody says that a gray alien visited them in their bedroom, they were alone, Mm -hmm. they saw this gray alien, it probed them, it stuck a needle in their eye, and then it, you know, went through the wall and left. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot's going on there, okay? Yeah. So, you could look at that as an analyst you could probe their psyche or you can you can break that down symbolically. You can find out what else is going on in their life. But that doesn't necessarily mean that didn't happen. Oh, right? no. Oh, right. no. That's Absolutely. a point that I want to make sure that everybody who's listening understands that I'm not saying, we're not saying that that didn't happen in the physical world concretely. No. no. Absolutely. We're looking at it psychologically. Right, right. You know, it's interesting. I'm reminded, I know that we're short on time, but I'll, 
uh, von Franz told the story. She was at a lecture that Jung was giving. And he said in the lecture that he had worked with a young woman who had been to the moon. And then he went on. And at the break, von Franz went up to him and said, oh, you know, Professor Jung, you meant she believed she went to the moon. And she said he looked her in the eye and said, she went to the moon. Yeah. And that was when she realized, and this, I think, is another gift that Jungian psychology brings to all of these topics. I am not going to let my attitude of what's possible judge your experience. Rather, I'm going to try to enter that shared space with you so that we can walk around that experience. And what I can do is bring various strategies and techniques to help you begin to loosen up and look at that experience. But no way would I, there's no way I could possibly say that this is not happening. That would be, that would be ludicrous. That would be grandiose in the extreme. That would be saying my understanding of the world is the understanding of the world. And that is basically insane. <laughs> and that is why I love Jungian psychology Absolutely. and why when I found it, I stopped looking mm -hmm. because I, you know, I, I went through it all and I was a psychology major in college and I was always interested in psychology. I saw a psychologist when I was in high school um, when I was in college, I studied it. I saw all different types of therapists because I was interested. I took all mm -hmm. different kinds of medication. It took me a long time before I realized, and even when I was with a Jungian analyst, how rare and special and unique this is because I am not being pathologized. I am not being told I'm crazy. I'm not right. being told I'm wrong. I'm not being given a pill. That's the most important thing because if you're given a pill, you're not going to be as conscious and you're not going to go through this as conscious as you could. And I feel safe when I'm with a Jungian because I know I'm not being judged. Mm -hmm. and you can explore these things right? and we're curious about it. Um, and I think they must be explored and you've given good examples. Why it's so persistent. Yeah. It would be ridiculous to dismiss. You know, it is being dismissed. And another thing that I heard on that show is people feared for their careers. They wouldn't talk about their experiences, no matter what the experience was, a light in the sky, uh, an alien in their bedroom, or a synchronicity. You know, where can people talk about these things without being ridiculed, without being judged, without being medicated? Yeah. A Jungian well, analyst is a good place to start. It's, and, and also those groups, like the group you said you would attend in um, Cleveland. In Cleveland, yeah, the Cleveland Ufology Project. There are a lot of those groups out there. And I there. think that they perform a very important grounding, very important healing function, in addition to whatever the ostensible mission of the group is, you know, just, you know dissemination of information or gathering of data or whatever. Right. And we haven't talked about the healing function in all this. And that might be a good thing to wrap up with. We've got about seven, six minutes left. And I think that I would love to leave on a positive note about, because Jung was, was about that. He was about Absolutely. The, yeah. the healing function of all this. Right. And the places where we're most wounded or we feel we're most wounded are actually the places where our own healing is to be found. And so that in all of the examples that you've given, I think there would be a gentle companioning of the person into that 
that system, into that set of beliefs or into that understanding um, in order to see what it meant for them. Why is it coming up now? And, and why the interest in this? Yes. What, what, what does this carry for you? What maybe? does it carry? What, you know, well, that, you know, what is the telos? Where is this bringing you? So if, for let's go back to one you said, if you believe that you originated elsewhere, if you believe that you have been primed to accept that there are, um, that there's intelligent life on other planets, how can you use that? Where is that leading you? How does that make your life richer? How does that make your relationships deeper? Can you use that to help you become more consolidated in terms of your understanding of who you are in the world? Yeah, so I see that those are the things that are really important. I think you know, they are. It's, yeah, it's not about aliens. It's not about UFOs. It's about us. Right. Right. And if these are the vehicles, if these are the events, mm-hmm. if these are mm-hmm. the manifestations that bring me to that place where I can begin to explore me through this, through yeah. the fashion that this pulls from me. Um, Jung talks about in his uh, article on flying saucers, the passion that people bring to it, right? the emotional energy. And, and thank heaven, he didn't believe that that was a problem. Right. But in fact, that was the motive force impelling uh, the person toward wholeness. Toward wholeness, right. right. We need to go back to that always. The psyche Which is, is the always seeking. Always yeah. seeking wholeness. Okay. Right. right. That's and the meaning of healing. That, that is what healing is, is to become whole. It is, right. And individuation is to heal our divisions. So would you tell us, I don't think we've defined, have we defined individuation a little bit? Yeah, I, individuation is what Jung called the process of um, healing that his therapeutic intervention facilitated. And it is helping a person own all of the parts of themselves, even the parts that they don't understand, and to see that who they are is much more connected and whole. So they don't have to spend their lives splitting and defending and projecting and we will all of us project, right? Mm-hmm. But we, there, there be, there's more fluidity, there's more ease that you bring to your life experience. And, and projection is, uh, is okay unless it's a problem and then it's, we yeah. need to look at it and withdraw right. it. Right. Projection is okay until we really believe the truth of our projections. Mm. Right. Because projection just happens. It's like, you know, if I do exercise, my skin will, will perspire. That's what projection is like. It's, it, it just is, it happens. It's something that the mind does. Okay. Well, this has been a fascinating talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. I hope the audience enjoyed it. You, Dr. James, were extremely articulate. You explained things really well. I'm really happy that we had these three hours with you. Um, We're coming to a close, and I just wanted to say a few words. I wanted to thank you for taking the time. Yeah, for taking the time tonight, staying up late. It's almost two o'clock in the morning here in Chicago. And there is a full moon. Uh, I think it's at 3.30 a.m. It's the strawberry moon tonight. And I want to give a shout out to Richard C. Hoagland, who we all miss and um, want to say hi to. And we love you. And we can't wait to hear your voice again. And we'll wait. We'll wait for you as long as it takes. And I'm really excited for your return whenever you're ready. And I thank you, Richard. I thank you for 
giving me this time to talk with Dr. James on your show. It's been a true honor and a privilege. And I'd like to thank you. And thank you, Kinthea. And thank you, Laura. For facilitating everything. Really appreciate your time. Really love the show. Thank you so much. Good night.